Hello everyone, Bioscholar here. While proteins themselves do not directly produce ATP, they play crucial roles in the process. In situations where carbohydrates and fats are scarce, the body breaks down proteins into amino acids. These amino acids are then converted into intermediates that enter the Krebs cycle, contributing to ATP production. Moreover, many enzymes, which are proteins, catalyze the chemical reactions involved in metabolic pathways like glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. These pathways generate ATP from glucose and other nutrients. In this video, I'll explain the entire process in detail, including where these processes occur. So let's get into it. Protein catabolism typically occurs during prolonged fasting, intense exercise, or when carbohydrates and fats are in short supply. This process consists of several stages. The first stage is proteolysis, where proteo refers to proteins and lysis refers to breakdown. So proteolysis is the breakdown of proteins into smaller polypeptides and amino acids. This process occurs in several steps. In the stomach, the acidic environment denatures proteins, making them more accessible to enzymatic action. Enzyme pepsin, secreted as an inactive zymogen called pepsinogen, is activated by the acidic pH and begins cleaving peptide bonds within the protein. As the partially digested proteins move into the small intestine, they encounter pancreatic proteases such as trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. These enzymes are also secreted as inactive zymogens and are activated in the intestinal lumen. Trypsinogen is activated to trypsin by the enzyme enterokinase, and trypsin then activates the other proteases. The final breakdown into free amino acids occurs at the brush border of the small intestine. Peptidases, including aminopeptidases and dipeptidases, further cleave peptides into individual amino acids. These amino acids are then absorbed into the bloodstream for use by the body. After proteolysis, free amino acids are released into the bloodstream, originating from the complex proteins in the food we eat. These amino acids are then transported to various tissues, including the liver, which plays a central role in their metabolism. The liver is the primary site for the metabolism of amino acids, including a process known as deamination. If you examine the structure of an amino acid, you'll notice a carboxylic group on one side and an amino group on the other, attached to the alpha carbon. During deamination, the amino group is removed from the amino acid. This reaction is typically catalyzed by enzymes called deaminases. The removed amino group is converted into ammonia. However, ammonia is toxic to cells if it accumulates, so the body quickly converts it into a less toxic compound, urea, through the urea cycle also known as the ornithine cycle in the liver. The urea is then transported to the kidneys for excretion. Meanwhile, the remaining carbon skeletons of the amino acids are converted into various intermediates that enter different metabolic pathways, ultimately contributing to energy production. So, let's quickly recap the process. Complex proteins are broken down into amino acids through enzymatic actions. These amino acids then undergo deamination, which produces ammonia and various intermediates. The ammonia is safely converted to urea and excreted, while the remaining carbon skeletons from the amino acids enter different metabolic pathways to produce energy. Now, let's dive into those intermediates and see how they contribute to energy production. First up, pyruvate. Amino acids like alanine, serine, and glycine break down into pyruvate. Pyruvate is a versatile intermediate. It can either be converted into acetyl-CoA to enter the Krebs cycle, or into lactate during anaerobic conditions. Pyruvate is also essential for gluconeogenesis, the process of making glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. Next, we have acetyl-CoA. Amino acids such as leucine, isoleucine, and lysine give rise to this crucial molecule. Acetyl-CoA is central to energy production as it fuels the Krebs cycle, generating ATP. It's also a key player in linking carbohydrate, fat, and protein metabolism. Then there's alpha-ketoglutarate. 
This intermediate is produced by amino acids like glutamate, glutamine, and arginine. Alpha-ketoglutarate is not only a critical component of the Krebs cycle, but also supports gluconeogenesis and the synthesis of other amino acids and neurotransmitters. Moving on to succinyl-CoA. Isoleucine, methionine, valine, and threonine are the amino acids that produce this intermediate. Succinyl-CoA is vital for the Krebs cycle and also plays a role in synthesizing heme, an essential component of hemoglobin. Fumarate comes next, generated by the breakdown of phenylalanine and tyrosine. This intermediate is involved in the Krebs cycle and can also participate in the urea cycle, where it's converted into malate, feeding into gluconeogenesis. Finally, we have oxaloacetate, produced from aspartate and asparagine. Oxaloacetate is crucial for the Krebs cycle, where it combines with acetyl-CoA to form citrate. It's also a starting point for gluconeogenesis, helping the body create glucose. For every intermediate, it's often said they play a crucial role in the Krebs cycle. So, I'll briefly cover the Krebs cycle here to give you a sense of where these intermediates fit into the process. But if you want a more detailed breakdown, check out the video link mentioned in the description box. The Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle or TCA cycle, occurs in the mitochondria and is a key part of aerobic respiration. It generates energy by oxidizing acetyl-CoA derived from carbohydrates, fats, and proteins into carbon dioxide, while also producing NADH and FADH2, which are used in the electron transport chain to produce ATP. Here's how each intermediate fits into the cycle. The Krebs cycle begins with acetyl-CoA, which is produced from pyruvate in a linking reaction. Acetyl-CoA then combines with oxaloacetate to form citrate. Citrate is subsequently converted into isocitrate. From here, isocitrate undergoes oxidation and decarboxylation to form alpha-ketoglutarat, which is then oxidized to produce succinyl-CoA. Next, succinyl-CoA is converted into succinate, generating GTP, which can be converted to ATP. Succinate is oxidized to fumarate, which is then hydrated to form malate. Finally, malate is oxidized to regenerate oxaloacetate, allowing the cycle to begin again. Throughout this process, the cycle produces three NADH molecules, one FADH2 molecule, and one GTP per turn, which are critical for ATP production in the electron transport chain. Electron carriers are then entered into electron transport chain and finally generate energy. That wraps up our detailed look at protein catabolism. I hope this video helped give you a clear understanding of the process. In the next video, we'll dive deep into fat catabolism, so stay tuned for that. If you have any questions about today's video, feel free to ask in the comments. And if you learn something new, consider subscribing, it really means a lot. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.